Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined with renowned, uh, legendary investor David Morgan of The Morgan Report. His website is TheMorganReport.com. Uh, premier expert when it comes to precious metals. That he specializes in studying the economy and studying, you know, what is going on in the markets. I mean, renewable energies, you know, even cryptocurrency. Now, he's an authority in the space, and and really, it's because he he's a very smart guy and he's nimble, and and that's what's important about uh, moving forward in today's economy is is being nimble and able to follow the trends and anticipate where the trend is going to be. So without any further ado, uh, David Morgan, thanks for coming on Crush the Street with me today. Well, Kenneth, kind of thank you for the nice introduction. If I can just add on, thanks. I'd say <clears throat> everything is pretty accurate with what you said, with the exception of I would consider myself to be um, all that uh, great on the cryptos, but certainly more studied than most. And as you know, I just did a webinar for free and for fun for everybody, and I picked Bitcoin. The reason I picked Bitcoin is, I guess I could say clickbait. I got a, you know some trolls were, that were upset, but I could have chosen any market. I could have done the S&P. I could have done silver. I could have done soybeans. It wouldn't have mattered because markets move due to uh, just really a couple of factors. It's buying pressure or selling pressure. But I use Bitcoin because so many people in the space are what I considered unwashed, unsophisticated investors. These are people that have never opened a brokerage account, may never open a brokerage account. They've never studied markets. They don't know how markets move. They don't know what the forces behind it. And they are, in some many cases, what I'll consider first-time investors that are very lucky, which means, you know, they bought Bitcoin and it was at, you know, 200 Watch it go to nineteen thousand. Now it's sitting. I don't have the price in front of me today, but you know seven, six, seven thousand, and <clears throat> they're up substantially, wishing that they sold at a, at the high. But you know they are believers. It's going to fifty thousand, hundred thousand, a million, whatever. So I chose Bitcoin, and I watched the webinar to illustrate how markets move, and this is something that's true of all markets, including cryptocurrencies and what's called overhead resistance. And I won't redo the webinar, but I do encourage people, especially those that are, let's say, still learning about markets and investing, to take the time. I think it's only 20 minutes. I can't get long-winded, but I try to make it succinct. Why do you give me feedback? We This is on the air. We didn't talk about it ahead of time. You know, like, All you told me is you watched it. What did you think of it? Was it worthwhile? Absolutely. We'll have the link in the description area regarding that. And it's so true. Markets just have a way of washing and uh, rinsing investors, David. And one of the things that I think is important, I, I think we'll, we'll study what happened in cryptocurrency, especially in 2017, for, for decades and years to come, the psychology of what took place. And, you know, I, I'd like to just ask you, going into this you know, new season, um, you know, where your sentiments are regarding Bitcoin going forward in light of what has just taken place <laughs> and how you think, uh, you know, much of the, the sector is going to respond going forward. Is there, uh, do you anticipate, you know, a, a real surge going forward here? I know you talked about this during your webinar, but you know, for people on the interview, I think this is very uh, pertinent information. You know, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and just the nature of these markets historically going forward? Well, my idea is a bit radical. First of all, let me just preface it with this. I am truly free market and I'm always learning new things. And I've certainly changed my opinion on several things in my lifetime and I've gotten stronger in some views and change views. <clears throat> the point I'm making is that it's not my place to tell anybody where to invest, how to invest. You know, as long as it's ethical, I mean, I, you know, I'm okay with it. I am not a big fan of Bitcoin. My article of about four years ago, which is titled My Two Bits About Bitcoin, uh, most of the stuff I wrote in that article coming to the fore, meaning that I said, if it really gets traction, watch the government interference. I didn't forecast an ETF, but I said, <laughs> you know, governments don't like competition. I still have some doubts about the origins of it. 
I mean, I have uh, access to the, I think it was the NSA white paper talking about uh, starting a, uh, basically a blockchain or a cryptocurrency. And then <clears throat> InQtel, which is the uh, CIA arm that funds uh, startups in the Silicon Valley, has a pretty good whack of Bitcoin from pretty much the initiation. So those two things put up a rat, red flag for me. That doesn't mean that it isn't, uh, you know, a great thing for you. You can make that determination. I can influence you, but I don't really care to. I'm just giving you my opinion. You can take it or leave it. However, you know, the basis, and I have a philosophical principle that I cannot shake. And that philosophical principle is that the whole monetary system needs to be based on truth, and it has to be based on something of value. And so the whole fiat system is based on a lie that we can create something out of nothing and the bankers have that advantage and they create the cognitive map, meaning they get everyone to think or they're brainwashed in parlance terms and in direct in your face terms. They brainwashed everybody into thinking that this digit that's on their bank computer that's accessed by a debit card or their phone actually has value. And as long as everybody buys into that belief, then the system will continue. And it has. With that foundation, what is behind a Bitcoin? Really nothing. I mean, yes, there's software and this and that. And I've heard all the arguments. Philosophically, it doesn't sit well with me because it's basically a creation that basically is nothing. Now, uh, you asked the question, I'm going to give you a long answer. You know me, I'll build you a watch. But it's important with the premise of what is the basis of most of the early cryptos. Now what you're seeing is a lot of, and I separate the crypto from the blockchain, <clears throat> there's a lot of blockchain-based asset-backed situations. So one I think most are familiar with, this is this T, the actual <clears throat> TEA from China that's on the blockchain. I'm involved with the silver-backed blockchain, reinstituting silver as money. Now, this isn't going to go from two cents to $297 because it isn't just a fiat unbacked sell it to the next person for a higher price system. It's based on the price of silver. However, it's also an asset based blockchain. So I think the next step, Kenneth, is actually a move toward not only precious metals based blockchains, but asset blo blockchains. You know, the DRC has done one with cobalt. You've seen them for lumber, tea, as I mentioned, uh, and a lot. So I think that's the next step. So I think the early phase, like in the tech boom, you're seeing the early adopters, and some of those will, will stay, Ethereum for sure, Bitcoin most likely, <clears throat> Litecoin, some of the other ones. Most of the other ones will go to the buy and buy. I mean, they'll just absolutely disappear. People that got into them that can't get out of them will lose money. And then the next phase up will be the blockchain that is uh, tied to assets. So hopefully I answered that question. And I want your thoughts. What do you think of that? You think I'm right? Think I'm wrong? Or are you just going <laughs> to wait and see? Well, I, I, I nimble. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that. And, you know, I'm very open to that, to being wrong. But I, I love what's going on with Bitcoin. And I'm open to value coming from areas that aren't so traditional. Um, some of the things that, you know, might be more intellectual or the network effect. And uh, maybe it's not something that, you know, we're going to be able to trust for thousands and thousands of years. But maybe it's more of like a, a 50 or 100 year timeline, uh, because there's a lot of people who put their value in, let's say, Anheuser-Busch and say, OK, well, I'm pretty confident that this company is going to do well. There's no guarantee uh, about that. And there's no guarantee in anything when it, in regards to our savings. But if you can stack the odds in your favor, um, you know, I, I'm open to that. And I think there's a lot of a, a great deal of value that there is in the Bitcoin network. And I, I like that it's obviously pulled back to the degree that we can now purchase more. It was very difficult to purchase on the way up. And, and I was fortunate to sell a great deal of my crypto on the way up and I'm happy to purchase uh, here at these levels. I know that the Bitcoin ETFs are on uh, are in 
talks right now. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there as, as the space continues to build out. So I'm very optimistic about that, but I'm always open to being wrong, <laughs> uh, which is also why I invest accordingly. I diversify and I do my best to uh, position myself in a way that I trend up as a whole. So. Well, I'd like to add one more thing before we move on to the next topic. First of all, although I'm philosophically opposed to an unbacked thing, I could make the argument, two arguments, or two things I'd like to state. One is that God bless Bitcoin because I'm all for alternatives and alternative currencies. So the one thing Bitcoin's done that I will applaud is it's got people thinking outside of the uh, you know, central bank controlled private banking cartels, mainly the Federal Reserve and the raw shields, you know, basically holding the, all nation states to uh, their domain, meaning that uh, the private bankers control almost everything. So there's competition. And without Bitcoin, I don't think you've seen much at all. So God bless Bitcoin for that. <laughs> and the other part, if you are so philosophically inclined to say, well, look, there's really nothing inherently wrong with the fiat system because even though it's unbacked, David doesn't know what he's talking about. And I'm happy with the system that's an alternative, the one that already exists, and you can sit with that philosophically, then be my guest. You know, it's just you ask me what I think. I'm pretty opinionated when I you know, study something. Uh, often people will say, what do you think about this? I, say, I don't have an opinion. I haven't mm -hmm. studied it long enough to form an opinion or sure. I'm still looking at it. So next topic, but thanks. I, I really want to get that out there because I'm not trying to be in the middle. I'm trying to do anything. But if there's one thing I could be really passionate about is thank you, Bitcoin. You woke up the world, and there, we need alternatives, and we need alternatives that are based on, you know, based on free markets and the people themselves. Now, again, to just digress back, you know, I'm still suspect where the origins of Bitcoin really came from, but that's for someone else to investigate further. I'm still, you know, aware of what I do know about it, but uh, it doesn't seem to dissuade those that are pro-Bitcoin, and that's fine. You know, they can do whatever they, they want to do. Sure. Yeah, you know, and it's a, it is a very powerful thing. And uh, yeah, let's, let's move on here. Talking about the economy, talking about that conventional wisdom and that sentiment. I mean, we, you know, there's a lot to unpack in regards to the, the economy. The Fed the, did not raise rates, but signals more rate heights to come. Trump has promised a 4% growth rate in the, the economy, and here we are. Things seem to be chugging along. Billions of dollars are being repatriated, and it's just such a difficult thing uh, because as Austrian econo economists, you look at the numbers, the sheer raw numbers, you say it's unsustainable, but the sentiment and the belief that things are good continue to move forward, which keeps everything intact. It keeps the stock market intact. It keeps the U.S. dollar intact, and it keeps precious metals down. So having said that, what are some of your thoughts on this? Well, I agree. I mean, to pare it back a little bit, I mean, markets move on psychology, not on, on math. I mean, certainly you can get into the numbers and find the value investing, what Buffett does for the most part. But basically, markets move more on psychology than they do on fundamentals. And that's something that's very important. So as you said, you know, I was asked before Trump was elected in Canada on one of their main uh, stations about, you know, what do you think about the election? What do you think, what would happen if Trump got in? I said, first of all, I'd preface it with the analogy of the Titanic. The ship has already hit the iceberg. But if Trump gets in, Sturge is coming up to first class. The band is going to play a lot more lively music. There'll be free drinks for everybody. And the party is back on and everyone is going to feel really good. That was my answer. And that's sort of a good analogy still. I think there's a lot of feel good, but the numbers, even though we got this 4%, we're going to go through it in a Morgan report and probably put out a mid report during this month because uh, of the length and breadth of the last report that just went out <clears throat> on the 6th. But uh, it's a lie. I mean, the 4% is a, a number. And I'm a little, you know, I'm not a big Trump fan, but he's certainly <clears throat> showing a lot of action and, it's really hard to figure out. But if you go back to the election, he talks about this is the biggest bubble. It's a bubble and the numbers are fake. But now he's taking credit for the economy doing so well. Low unemployment here, low unemployment there. The economy's never looked better and the blah, 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 blah. Which to me is disingenuous to what he said on the campaign trail because he was well aware and stating such 
that these numbers basically are, I mean, I didn't use to admit fake numbers, but they are. So we're going to go through the 4%, but again, it's psychology. And I, I forecast this myself, as I just said, and as he, you know, did become president, I think, and you see not only gold and silver, that people are like selling back or moving on or not interested in buying. Most of the retail dealers I talk to, and these are the big ones, even the wholesalers are basically, you know, just in dire straits. I mean, there's very little activity in the physical realm in, the, in that. You look at food storage, you know, this uh, emergency food for, you know, hurricanes or, God forbid, some type of a prolonged emergency action. Those sales are well off. So basically anything across the prepper scale, across the precious metals, all that has gone very much south. It's very, very, um, uh, doing very poorly. Whereas uh, the more conventional, you know, things are great. We don't have to worry anymore. You know, pension's good and economy's good and, you know, all blah, 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 <clears throat> continues onward. And the truth is it hasn't really changed that much. Yes, there has been some job creation. Yes, there's been a lot of repatriation of money back. That's true. Um, and there's been, you know, it's not all bad, but what I'm trying to be is objective about the numbers and the numbers that the, that the government is throwing out are as jury-rigged as they've ever been. That's my point. Hmm. You know, David, I actually want to go back to something you said um, and you're just thanking Bitcoin. And it's true. I, I love that there's competition in the markets. And uh, I just wanted to add something right here that I was thinking, you know, in that last topic. And that is uh, just thankful for the internet, the opportunity to share information. And, you know, we saw the exposure of the lies. Uh, just one example was the election. Everyone was so shocked that Trump won. And, you know, there was only a few sources that were talking about the true support that he had. And I think him winning was exposure across the mainstream conventional wisdom that there's a lot of lies going on. And I'm even thankful to YouTube as much censorship and, you know, Facebook, I was much censorship and Google that's going on, even with Alex Jones. I know Sean of the SGT report had a problem, but, you know, he came around with the uprising of the community. Thankful for that. But Alex Jones, you know, being shut down, would we'll disagree with him, agree with him. It's just a canary in the coal mine for what's going on. But uh, I'm grateful for things moving forward and exposing the lies that are going on. We're talking about this morning. I think a lot more people believe that what is being reported are to be questioned. And, and I'm very grateful for that. So um, with the headline numbers and, you know, Apple going on to be the world's first trillion dollar company, people not being scared about a recession and the last recession, such a long, such a long distant memory now. I mean, how quickly could all of this turn? Or is this such, uh, like you described it, such a large barge like the Titanic that it is going to take some time uh, for it to really start to unravel and to sink? Well, that's a real tough one. And, you know, I think it was Jesse Livermore, it may not be, I may be quoting, the quote's accurate, I can't remember the source, but you know, how did you go broke? Well, very, very slowly, then all at once. And if you think about how a ship, if you've ever had a toy boat um, or in the bathtub, I don't know, you know that like if you sink a, a ship, whatever size, it takes on water slowly, slowly, slowly. But at the last, you know, three minutes, all it takes is a little bit of water changes the mass enough to really all of a sudden, bang, it just starts going down quickly. So that's my analogy. I think we're going to see We'll muddle on and muddle on and muddle on and muddle on until we don't anymore. And then there could be, all, you know, all of a sudden things change rapidly. So I think it's, I'm not trying to weasel out of the answer. It's actually how I see it. So I think most people will be blindsided by it. That's why I like the analogy. I'd rather be, you know, six months too early than six minutes too late. Ah. Because you may be in a market where, you know, gold looks so passe and I can get any time and it's still under 1350. Maybe it'll break out this time. Maybe it won't. Blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden it's like um, there's a big problem in the financial system and gold shoots up a hundred bucks and it's up limit and they close all futures trading. 
because of the activity. So they stop it. So now the retail market takes off and has bid 150 bucks that day or whatever. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just using, you know, gold is one of the things I'm the most familiar with and studying for most of my life. But that's an example. <clears throat> is that going to take place? I don't know. But you asked me what I think. I think it'll be not necessarily that scenario, but that idea that it just muddles along and no one's paying attention to it. And I've got all this time and it really doesn't matter. And on and on, and all of a sudden, there is a shift from whatever source. I mean, you just don't know. It could be the bond market, it could be the stock market, it could be war, it could be food, it could be water, it could be a weather event, it could be a satellite situation. I mean, who knows? But it could, but it could all of a sudden accelerate, and people are going, oh, man, I wish I would have bought back my gold position, or oh, geez, I wish I would have gotten more you know, of this or whatever. So... That's how I think it'll unfold. That's kind of what history shows us, that uh, people are very much normalcy bias, meaning that tomorrow is going to be just like today. There's really no fear. Don't worry about it. And it always happens to the other guy, not to me. But ask that of, you know, some of these people that have experienced these weather events or, you know, currency crisis. I mean, you talk to anybody in Venezuela that was there for, you know, quite their lives. And, you know, Venezuela was like rocking and rolling. Mm-hmm. as far as their economy is concerned. And then uh, when their their great leader came in, the one that passed away, I mean, Chavez was like going to make everything even better. And it seemed to be that way for a while. But um, there's lots of great books that the left could read if they're so inclined, but most aren't, to really study the facts. And the facts are that uh, something for nothing doesn't work. And that's the way the capitalistic system is set up now. Something for nothing doesn't work as well for either system, for either system. So let me be very clear about that. And this is why we have such problems today, because the left is more inclined to be like, well, let's just redistribute everything for everyone, and we really don't have to work for it. And then the right, even though most won't admit it, but I will. And I'm not on the right, by the way. I'm pretty neutral. I don't like politics, but they're there is, you know, what's the analysis yeah. of the monetary system? Well, the bank gets something for nothing as well. So it's either the elite gets something for nothing and the rich get richer and the 1% dictates to the rest of us what we're going to do, or you can go to the other side and, and do what I just said. So it's really a precarious situation. And, you know, we'll just go broke really, really slowly and, and all of a sudden. David, so one of the things that we're seeing a major shift in is uh, – is the market I'm noticing uh, many people are making the case for silver specifically and the clean energy demand being the upward catalyst. Now I know you're huge on silver. Uh, you're the authority. You're, you're, you're the silver uh, investor, you know, silver hyphen investor um, dot com. I know that that's your website. So, you know, let's talk about silver here. And I, I think you've got some interesting things to say about it. But, yeah, just to preface you uh, here, the clean energy demand, uh, can you share some information on that and kind of what people are, are talking about and, you know, why this is so important? Sure. And, again, I want to just give you a bit of a foundation. So if you go back to about the year 2005, so back uh, 13 years, the industrial demand for silver was 35% of the market. So 35% every year of the silver demand came from industrial uses. And that was when we were mining about 550 million ounces on an annual basis. Today, we mine about 850 million ounces on an annual basis. And the demand on the industrial side is 55% of the market. Mm-hmm. So that's something to bear in mind, Kenneth and listeners. Wow. So silver's industrial demand has gone from 35% to 55% in roughly 15 years. And the whole time the the production has scaled up from 550 to 850 million ounces. However, all markets move on the margin, which means you need investment demand to move the price higher and higher and higher. And the investment demand has been very sluggish, uh, as I said at the beginning of the interview. So coming to your specific, yeah, the, uh, the clean energy, solar particularly, photovoltaics has been on a ramp up. It's kind of leveled off. It's starting to accelerate again. The reason, uh, if you look back, I've done this in other interviews, so those that have heard me before, just turn off the show for two minutes and come back. But 
the, the projection was to be about 140 million ounces on an annual basis. We're a little over half of that. And the projection was actually very accurate. The reason that we're at half of that is because the efficiency of every ounce of silver has doubled over the last decade or so, which means that is in any market, you want to get the best performance for the least amount of cost possible so you can increase your profit margin. Mm -hmm. And that's true of photovoltaics as well as anything else. So if the efficiencies could not have been increased by double, uh, our rate of use would be about 140 million ounces of silver. Having said that, it seemed to be accelerating again. The one that you know, it hasn't been talked about too much. Of course, I'm looking into pretty deeply, and that is, uh, you know, storage, this battery thing with, you know, cobalt, lithium. Silver's uh, probably going to be one of the better ones, but it's so expensive relative to these other metals that uh, it's hard to determine. But there certainly could be, I say could, not would, be the availability of silver used as an energy storage type of system. But yet, um, that again is to be determined but it is a green metal it certainly helps in water a great deal it helps uh purify a lot of things and even in the nano field it's it's uh, very much a requirement so it's an incredibly essential metal that most people know very little about and it's certainly very undervalued but as far as the greenest metal out there silver is it David, so it's been pretty gut-wrenching to see gold go back under $1,300. I haven't checked it this morning, but it's getting awfully close to $1,200. Um, and then obviously silver is following in suit um, at its current level. Now, what are your thoughts on this price moving at the moment? Does it have a lot to do with what's going on with the economy? What do you attribute this to, and, and what do you see going forward? Well, I mean, I, you know, as a cop out, but also the most accurate answer anyone could give you, there's been more selling pressure than buying pressure, and that's driven it down. What's really upset me is that the uptrend line for gold was at 1240, and once we reached that, it was two years from the bottom of December 2015. So all of 2016 was a very good year for the metals. 2017, a mediocre, a poor year for silver, but a good, decent year for gold. It was up year over year in 2017. And now we're halfway through 2018. So we had a two and a half year uptrend line to the 1240 level, which was breached just what, three weeks ago. Uh -huh. So that is a bad technical indicator. I don't think we're going to take out that low that was in December 2015, but I think we have some work to do. August is almost always the worst month for the metals. So if you're a contrarian, contrarian, now would be the time to start looking at this sector, silver especially. And the other interesting thing is that the underlying mining shares usually lead when we are back to a bull market. What's fascinating is more of your top companies like we have in the Morgan Report, the ones that really make you money, the ones that most people don't pay attention to, um, are at levels when gold was $100 higher. So the stocks are performing as if gold was $100 higher. So they're acting as if gold is like 1300 and so the silver stocks are acting as if uh, silver was at like 17 or 18. So the stocks are actually kind of shrugging off this downturn that we're seeing recently. Not all of them, but the ones that are the most worth owning. And by the way, I just have to throw this in here. I mean, Morgan Report from day one has looked much more than at silver and gold stocks. I mean, we look at resource sector. We do Molly. We did lithium before anybody. We did rare earth elements before anybody. I was the first one to recommend a cobalt stock. Uh, lithium, this real story isn't out there. There's about 400 years with the lithium on the planet. No one else will probably even tell you that. So anyway, back to you. Um, but that's how I see it. Now's the time to get in. I think it'll firm up by the end of the year. I think 2019 will be a good year. I know I said that a year ago or something, and I'm wrong so far. And I am. I admit it. You know, it's hard. It's tough. I mean, you know, you can always use the, it's manipulated, which it is. And I don't like to use that excuse. I like to do my analysis factoring in that it's manipulated. But I didn't really properly factor what we talked about. How much money that was possibly going into this sector has moved into cryptocurrencies and given up on the metals altogether. And it's a much greater number than I expected it to be. Sure. Yeah, it's a powerful thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all about being nimble. And that's what I, one thing I appreciate about you and your analysis 
And, you know, it's the only way to really approach uh, the future. So, uh, David, again, thanks for coming on Crush the Street. If people want to learn more about the Morgan Report, uh, reach out to you, uh, please let them know what they can expect to find and how to find your work. The best thing to do, I mean, to get it all is just go to Google or, or Bing or any search engine and type in David Morgan Silver. If you don't put in silver after my name, you'll never get there from a search engine. But the really best way is just go to themorganreport.com. That's our main website, themorganreport.com. Get on our free email list. I do a podcast every week. I've got a YouTube station. I have a Twitter feed and even a corporate, I think, Facebook presence, which I don't use. I don't even know how to log into it, but my secretary posts these interviews on our Facebook account. But the best one, I think, for people to save time is to just get on the podcast. And you can go to the main website again, themorganreport.com. There's some pull-down menus, pretty easy site to navigate. And you can uh, you know, get on the free, uh, the free email. Every weekend we put out uh, all the stuff I've done for the week for free, which is interviews like this or any commentary. And my wrap-up, I do a weekly perspective almost every week, except once in a while on this because of you know, travel commitments or whatever. So thank you for allowing me to do that, Kenneth. I do. Uh, Want to say, you know, for the record, I did call every top in the silver market, especially the one in 2011, at $48. I did tell everybody, my people first, of course, they pay me. But I told them, you know, this is it. And be prepared for a couple of years of downtrend. You know, if you've got big positions, put on a hedge, buy puts, you know, write cover calls, do whatever you need to do. And I was wrong. I was accurate, totally right about the top. And when it occurred, what I was wrong about was the duration of the bear cycle within a major bull trend. I really thought at that time that it'd be maybe two years in length. And of course, it's been about six. So I stand corrected. We've had really, it's hard to argue. It looks, depends if you look at gold or silver. Gold basically is, as I just said, was making a nice bull move for two and a half years, and that's failed again. So kind of no man's land doesn't mean you shouldn't always keep a position of maybe 10% in the metals. I've never said put everything in the metals. Uh, I know there's people that overload in that sector. And if you're going to get into this sector, more money has been made by you know the mining sector or the oil sector than anything else. But these are really tough long shots. And that's where most people spend most of their time is these little penny micro companies. And most of them fail. You have a very, very bad chance of making big money in that sector. And this is what almost the entire industry talks about. Whereas someone like me that's been through that whole cycle once before in their life and realized the truth of the matter, decided to buy stuff that really made sense. For example, one of our main picks back in the early days is up about 900%. And the dividend, although it's only a modest like 1% right now, if you bought what I told you to buy, you're getting about a 10% dividend on the money that you invested. So, you know, if you buy right and hold and sit tight, you can do very well in this sector. Uh, we also have opportunities. We were on Kirkland Lake like, you know, early on. And it just makes a new high and a new high and a new high and a new high. So that's when we're proud to have recommended to our subscribers. And then on the speculative side, we have something that uh, I think is better than anything that uh, Miriam Katusa has found. I'm really, really proud of uh, the work that we've done in this particular sector. No one knows it outside of Morgan Report subscribers. And that's good and bad. It's good because uh, they get the opportunity first. It's bad because unless someone else sees the opportunity and recommends it, it's going to be kind of uh, treading in water for a while, which is where we're at now. An investment bank came in with a multiple million dollar investment into this company and it's now selling that lower price than they funded it at. So it's really an opportunity for those that are out there that do like to speculate with money they can afford to lose, which is what I teach into this particular sector that is basically a technology stock in the mining space. It revolves around, as you know, Kenneth, the electronic waste sector. And I think this company is going to dominate everything else out there by far. And again, we are, we've been looking at this now for quite some time. That's awesome, David. Uh, David, you are truly an authority and a, and a leader, a thought leader in the sector and the investment space overall. I appreciate your knowledge and thank you for helping us to understand market psychology and how to be better equipped to advance 
in our financial situation. So thanks for coming on Crush the Street with me today. I look forward to future conversations very soon. Thank you, Kenneth. Appreciate it.